Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Danny Lichtenfeld, director of the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center. I want to thank you for being here for our very first live streamed event. Maybe the first of many, we shall see. I hope you're all staying safe, healthy, and sane. As you may know, we invited Dionne Searcy to speak about her new book, In Pursuit of Disobedient Women, and her work as West Africa Bureau Chief for the New York Times, because the issues and ideas that Dionne explores in her book resonate strongly with one of the exhibits we have up at the museum right now. That's Alison Wright's Grit and Grace, the Empowerment of Women at Work in Global Communities. Ideally, we would be sitting in the museum in the same room together and with Dion, surrounded by Allison's photographs, but that's obviously not in the cards. So we're very grateful to Dion for her willingness to share her thoughts in this format and to all of you who have tuned in. As for seeing Allison's photographs, I encourage you to check them out on our website, brattleboromuseum.org. And uh, if we can reopen the museum before October 12th, then you'll have a chance to see them in person too, because we've extended the exhibit and the other exhibits that are up right now, which no one is seeing through that date. Before I introduce Dion, I would just like to explain a few things about how we expect this event to unfold this evening. I'll be leaving the screen shortly when Dion begins her presentation. When she's finished, I will come back and then we're going to have a Q&A. If you're connected here via Zoom, then there are a couple ways you can participate in the Q&A. The first way is to type in your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can do that during Dion's presentation or afterwards when we get to the Q&A. The other option, which is only available during the Q&A session, is to use the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. When you do that, I'll be notified that you want to ask a question and I'll be able to unmute you and you can ask your question yourself rather than typing it in. But again, we'll only be using that function during the Q&A session, not during the talk itself. So don't bother raising your hand during the talk itself. I think you'll see that there's also a chat button on your screen. That is available for you to send a message to me or to our invisible yet indispensable events manager, Jessica Nelson, who's helping coordinate all of this behind the scenes. Um, if you have any technical issues or something else that you'd like to, us to try to help you with, use the chat button for that. If you're here via Facebook Live and would like to ask a question or make a comment, then please use the comment function in Facebook and Jessica will be relaying those questions and comments to me when we get to the Q&A. With all that said, I ask in advance for your patience and forgiveness for any technical challenges we encounter. We've never done this before, and we're trying our best to make it work well. So uh, let's get underway, shall we? Dion Searcy, tonight's speaker, is a politics reporter at the New York Times. She formerly worked as the paper's West Africa bureau chief, covering social, political, and economic issues in 25 countries in West and Central Africa with a focus on Nigeria's war against Boko Haram. She joined the Times in 2014 as an economics reporter, writing a series of stories about the changing middle class of America. Before joining the Times, she spent nine years at the Wall Street Journal, where she was an investigative reporter and also covered national legal affairs and the telecom industry. Prior to that, she covered politics at Newsday, the State House and Education Beats at the Seattle Times, as well as crime and criminal courts for the Chicago Tribune and the City News Bureau of Chicago. She's covered a range of topics, including women suicide bombers in West Africa, victims of gang warfare in Chicago, a fiscal crisis in Long Island, checkpoint killings of civilians in Iraq, overseas corporate corruption, patent disputes, insider trading issues, asbestos litigation fraud, the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, and hurricanes Katrina and Sandy. Dion was raised in Nebraska and graduated from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. 
Her book, In Pursuit of Disobedient Women, was published by Penguin Random House on March 10th of this year. It's available through all the usual outlets, and you can find a link to purchase the book from the web page for this event at brattleboromuseum.org. Would you please welcome Dion Searcy. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for having me, Danny, and thanks to everybody for joining tonight. Um, so I am going to tell you about a series of women I met in my reporting in West Africa. So in 2015, I became the West Africa Bureau Chief for the New York Times. And I was kind of living in, in Brooklyn with my husband and our three kids, and we were really in a work-life rut, um, and we had a dual career relationship, and we wanted to shake things up. So we moved to Dakar, Senegal. And in the job for the New York Times, I covered um, 25 countries. And so it was this huge swath of land um, in West and Central Africa. And I could write about anything I wanted um, in, in that geographic region. And what I chose to do is, is focus on a few certain themes. But as I went about my reporting, you know, I kept coming across these women and started unspooling this, this thread of amazing, incredible women doing interesting things. And I feel like we never really hear that much about West African women and what their life is like um, when looking at issues in that region. And that's, that's for a lot of reasons, but the main reasons are because men control governments, they control boardrooms, they control family life, they make all the decisions in society. And so often um, women are just invisible. Um, they, in some areas, they can't own land. Um, and they're really expected, even, even in some big cities, they're expected to cook and clean and have babies, and that's pretty much their role. So I think for me, coming across women who were bucking expectations was really, really fascinating and all the more noteworthy. And so what I tried in my reporting to do is focus on four or five major themes and um, organize my work around that that way. One was climate change, and that's because the Sahara Desert was kind of encroaching, you know, from the north into different countries. Um, and that was having an impact on farming, on pollution, you know, was on the rise, and all kinds of societal um, changes were happening because of that. I also was interested in urbanization, and that is um, a lot of farmers, you know, just like in America, a lot of people were moving to the cities. People were giving up their farms and moving to look for work um, in bigger cities. Um, I was interested in demographic changes and that in, in West Africa, there was a booming, booming population, but especially in young people. And there was also a rise in extremism and um, in Islamic extremism in particular. And Often I found all those four themes were really intertwined and related and sort of layered onto each other. So I'm gonna start um, sharing my screen and see how this goes. But uh, I went to rural Senegal to work on a story about climate change. And if I can get this to work, there we go, okay. Uh, so I went to rural Senegal to work on a story about climate change. And I, what, what was happening in this part of Senegal was rains were fewer and farther between during the rainy season. The downpours came less frequently. Um, there was just no water. And you can see in this photo, I mean, you could look for the ground, you know, for miles around. I mean, it was just really dry and, and parched. And... This is a woman called Khadija, and she was a peanut farmer. And what had happened with Khadija is she lived there with her husband, and they would take walks around at night. They farmed the peanut fields and would, would walk around their small, small conservative Islamic village and realize that um, other people were doing better than them. I mean, they lived in a little house and there were other people who lived in big giant concrete houses. Um, people had satellite dishes, they had cars and motorbikes. People even had iPhones. Um, not everyone, but a few people did. And the reason was people in that village, men, 
had sailed to Europe and had found some kind of work and were able to send money home. Now, for the majority of men, um, that didn't work out. Um, many, many men drowned at sea. Um, these, these men were taking a route um, across the Mediterranean that was billed the most dangerous route possible um, in, in all of the crossing of that sea. And this was at the same time that Syrians were going across. And um, Syrians, you know, were fleeing war. But men like Khadija's husband and other West African men were just fleeing normal life. And it was a really tragic thing because, you know, they, they were going across in wooden boats. They couldn't swim. Um, sometimes they were in rubber dinghies. The sea was really treacherous. And they even, many of them had to cross a desert before they got to the water. So many of them died even in the desert. Um, so it was a very, very risky situation. But I had heard in this village that it was a village of just women um, and got to the village and had found out that no, there were actually men there too. So I had to kind of change my reporting. And, but what I found was Khadija living there. And like I said, so she had, she had been walking around with her husband and they decided that he should go across the Mediterranean and risk it. And so he gets in a boat and she, didn't hear from him for like five or six months. She thought he was dead I and mean, she didn't know what to do. And during that time, um, she was expected in this very conservative village to just sit around. I mean, she was supposed to rely on charity and handouts for um, survival. And these women, when they got married, they would go live with um, their husband's family. And so she was in charge of a household of some dozen or so people and taking care of her mother-in-law and father-in-law who were elderly and kids and her kids and her uncle or her brother-in-law's kids. And so she had this whole household that she was running and she was expected to do it just waiting on her husband to provide for her and waiting on people to give her money um, just as charity. And she got really frustrated. And, you know, her husband finally called and he said, I made it. Don't worry about me. You know, I don't, I've had a terrible time, but I'm not even going to tell you what happened. It was so bad. Just know that I'm here. I'm alive. And she was really relieved. And he didn't call again for like four or five months. And she got really frustrated during that time. And as you can imagine, I mean, she thought of divorce. She thought of how mad she was about the whole situation. She missed their walks around the village, and she even missed sex. And that's one thing that I really think that we never, ever hear about when we talk about West African women, um, about their sex lives. And I, I even one time had a, an NGO, um, I think he was, he was American or French, a uh, guy who worked for a healthcare NGO who told me that West African women, um, they, don't, they don't get pleasure out of sex. They don't have any kind of sex life. And, and it just sounded absurd to me and it wasn't true. And Khadija was really open with me. And she um, walked me around and I'll show you, she showed me her, her bedroom. And um, that's a picture of Khadija just as she's, as she's um, preparing her meals. But she showed me her bedroom and she's like, I really miss sex. I miss sleeping with my husband. And I miss all the things that wives miss, you know, about their husbands. And she was so frustrated one day and kept walking by this donkey that the couple had as she was hauling water from the well back and forth to like these giant jugs of water um, that she would haul back and forth to, to feed her or to, you know, give her family some water and to cook with. And she'd walk by the couple's donkey. And one day she just decided like, screw it. I'm going to get that donkey. I'm going to hook it up. I'm going to have it, you know, haul the water for me. I'm going to put a wagon behind it or, or whatever and help it, um, have it help me. And I'm going to use the donkey to plow my fields and I'm going to get to work. I just have to raise money for my family. I can't keep relying on my husband. And this was a huge scandal in the community of conservative men. And I'm going to read you um, the first few paragraphs of my story because I think it sums it up the most. Um, Years had passed since her husband had crossed the sea to look for work in Europe. Left behind, Khadija 
Jigaraga trudged to the couple's peanut fields alone every day, struggling to earn enough to provide for an extended family of 13. When the town's water pump broke and her faucet went dry, she tied a donkey to a cart to haul water from a nearby well, cursing her absent husband the whole way. Her actions shocked this small conservative village in rural Senegal. Guiding animals was men's work, the village leader said. It's not a sight I ever want to see, said Baba Jallo, 70 years old, sitting in the shade of a dried cornstalk canopy, shaking his head as if to rid himself of the memory. This was something that the men just, it, it was just scandalous to them that a woman would actually get behind an animal and do what was considered men's work. But Khadija, you know, other women followed her. Um, and, and I went around to a lot of surrounding villages there and found women who also had found ways around this. Their husbands, some of them had died on the, on the route to, um, to Europe, um, but they had also shunned their elders. One woman was creating a pea patch and she had planted eggplants and some other things and then would share the vegetables with her fellow women, um, other widows or other people in the village who also um, their men were missing. And they would sell the vegetables at market and share the proceeds. So um, oh, there's one other picture I wanna show you. This is Khadija's bedroom and that's her bed. Um, and she, that's, you know, she was telling me about how she missed her husband there. Um, so she was this really fascinating go-getter um, who had startled the town by her ability to go to work. Um, and so I wanted to tell you about how other women in other areas were, were doing similar things. And let me get this screen here, okay. So a friend had sent me a story from a local newspaper that had mentioned women were filing for divorce more. And it wasn't women were, um, were getting divorced more, it was women were the ones who were initiating the divorces. And this was interesting to me because, you know, um, women didn't really have a lot of power in West Africa and that they would take it upon themselves to, you know, get out of a marriage, seem like something worth exploring. And, I went to the country of Niger to work on another story and had mentioned this to a UNICEF worker who, um, a local guy who I was working with and was showing me around. And he said, oh yeah, um, I have heard of that and I know someone who we can ask. But first I wanna to explain to you, Niger is a place that really bottoms out on the charts of all the bad things. Um, it's one of the poorest countries it has the lowest rate of educated girls, um, the highest rate of, among the highest rates of forced marriage, of child marriage. Um, you know, it just had all kinds of, all kinds of, you know, the, the bad indicators were happening there. And in this community of Marathi, um, it's a farming area near the um, Nigerian border. It was between Niger and Nigeria. Um, it had relied on trade with Nigeria, and there was a war raging then um, in that in Nigeria and in that part of Nigeria um, nearby to there with Boko Haram, and that's an extremist group that I'll tell you about later. But the economy had taken a real hit, and so I went to see this Islamic judge that my UNICEF um, contact had put me in touch with. His jurisdiction was about 2 million people in the region. He was called the Caddy of the Sultan of Marathi. And um, he settled land disputes, like petty crime, you know, all kinds of little, little kinds of cases. And I went to his dusty um, court chambers and, and sat, you know, among the pictures of the Quran and religious leaders and and said, Judge, you know, what's going on? I'm hearing more women are getting divorced. And his eyes got really big. And I was like, whoa. And I thought, oh, you know, here comes the patriarchy. He's going to give me some kind of lesson about women. You know, he, was, he just seemed like this very conservative guy. And he explained to me, like, listen, this is a wartime economy. And times are tough. And women, you know, women were having a really hard time finding men. And they deserved men who provided for them and who treated them well. He even said they deserved to have the sex life that they wanted. But the biggest problem for him was the fact that women wanted to work and the men would not let them. 
And he really thought that if husbands couldn't provide in this, you know, terrible economy, that the women deserved a chance to pitch in for the family. And, you know, he, he told me, you know, he, he wasn't granting divorces willy nilly. He was really trying to slow things down, but he really fundamentally believed that if a woman wasn't happy, she shouldn't stay in a bad marriage. And so I felt like a fool for misjudging him because he, I somehow managed to find like this feminist Islamic judge um, in the middle of rural Niger. It was really impressive and interesting. Um, but, you know, these huge forces were, were bearing down on rural Niger. Um, people were moving to cities. And the interesting thing was, even if you didn't know someone who, or even if you didn't move to a city yourself, you knew someone who did. And that person, you know, maybe it was a brother or a cousin or a friend, had come back from the capital and told you about how things were there. And they were different than this conservative, you know, society that hadn't changed for years. And, and there was also the spread of the internet was happening. I mean, 3G was really almost everywhere I ever went in West Africa and Central Africa. Not, not totally everywhere, but pretty close. And all this was showing women that there were other ways to live. And even the AIDS epidemic had opened the door to frank talk about sex as you know, NGOs and governments and the United Nations tried to fight that. So all these things were swirling around and coming down to bear at this judge's um, chambers, at, at his courtroom. And you're looking right now on the screen at his courtroom. He sat, he laid these plastic mats out for everybody else. And he sat on, his court bench was a double sheepskin rug. And he would sit there with his toes poking out and the guy in the glasses on the, on the I guess it's the left of your screen is, is the judge there with the white beard. And he would sit there and handle all these cases. And he said, just come with me. And he scooted, scooted in a, a place for me. And you can see there were men who would come and listen to the cases all day long. I mean, they were like 10 or 12 deep. It was like Niger's own Judge Judy. It was so like, like the source of gossip and, and you know, almost like a, a TV show. If you've ever seen a court case, there's so much, you know, interesting stuff that goes on during a case and it was no different there. So he invited me to sit with him and I sat there in his court um, for eight days, not, not eight straight days, but I dipped in and out of his courtroom for eight days. And you know, he heard cases about abortion and deadbeat dads. And even one time there's a fight between two prostitutes that he got upset about and you know, told them to get out of his courtroom. And it was just entertainment. And, but he wanted me to hear these divorce cases. And so the woman on the right of the screen in the, you can see kind of part of her pink hijab with the baby, her name was Zalika. And Zalika came up to the courtroom and plopped down and started reading off this list, like flour, butter, um, you know, spices, a container, a teapot, a kettle for, you know, washing for prayers. And I didn't realize what was going on, but. And I don't think the judge did either, but what she was doing was reading off a list of her belongings that she wanted to get back when she, when the divorce was final, the, the belongings that she had brought to the marriage. And the judge was like, whoa, wait a minute, you know, we, let's slow down. Let's, let's figure out what's going on here. And so she started telling the story of her marriage. And Zalika had met the, her husband, Nora, who's the guy in the blue, who's sitting cross-legged right there. She had met him at a wedding, and um, those are really big pickup spots for, for this part of the world um, and in America too, right? But um, so she goes to this wedding, and Nora sees her and comes over to her and says, you know, hey, I'm a really devout Muslim. Um, and that, that pretty much passed for like the, the chief pickup line. I heard it all the time. Um, women, women would tell me that that's how they met their husbands with that line. And so she, um, you know, she didn't like him at first, but then got to know him and decided that he was pretty nice. And you know, he wooed her, he gave her like scarves and spices and little presents. And, you know, she felt like she could talk to him just for forever. He listened to everything she said. And she decided that he would do and, you know, she wanted to get married to him. 
So they got married. Now, Zuleika had been studying to become a tailor. She really wanted to be a woman who could provide for herself. Well, Nura was also a tailor, and Nura said to her, Ah, oh, Zuleika, you know, you don't, need to, you don't need to waste money on school. I'll teach you how to sew. You know, you don't need to go take those classes. So she quit. And Zuleika had been living in a compound um, with tons of, you know, with all her family, with her mom, her grandma, her sisters and brothers, her um, cousins, there were kids everywhere, there were animals, you know, little rabbits were running around and kittens. And it was just this very bustling, um, like little mini city kind of, um, there were probably 30 or so people in the compound. And when she married Nora, he took her to his house and it was just his house and just Nora. And every day Nora went to work. And Zalika was really bored and alone. And she looked out the window and she would see other women leaving, but, but Nora didn't want her to leave. And she, she sent, you know, she, so things kind of started to deteriorate as they do in relationships. And uh, she would go out for walks with Nora and see him kind of giving the side eye to other women. And that bugged her. Um, she sent him out one day for, for yams and he came home with potatoes. She was very annoyed by that. And she sent him out for medicine one day and he came home not till the end of the day, you know, hours later after she'd sent him out and he forgot the medicine. And I feel like anybody in any kind of a relationship can relate to that kind of like annoying feeling about your spouse when you ask them to do something and they don't do it. And so um, I found myself really nodding along with Zuliko when she was telling all this, when she was talking about all this stuff. I could find her very relatable, um, her annoyance at her husband, but it just got worse and worse. Uh, but the worst part, you know, was that she was alone inside her house and her husband wouldn't let her leave. She missed her family and she missed her friends. And so she turned to her little pocket radio. And in this part of the world, radio is huge. Everybody listens to the radio all the time, BBC, you know, local channels, whatever. And she was no different. So she turned on her radio and there was a soap opera that she liked to listen to. And in that soap opera, the woman was stuck in what she saw as a loveless marriage. She just wasn't happy. And the woman in the soap opera decided that her husband wasn't treating her right and she was going to get a divorce. And that really empowered Zalika. I mean, and this is a woman whose mother, you know, had um, her own mother had had been a product of a forced marriage. She married a stranger and stuck with him for 40 some years. So her mother was outraged that Zalika would do this. And Nora started doing some other things too. He, um, that were, that were pretty unforgivable. I think maybe <laughs> you could say she had a baby and he didn't bother to come to the hospital. Um, he had bought her part of a sewing machine and then took it back. I mean, he was just kind of being like, you know, she was annoyed. And so by the time um, she came to the judge, she was just ready to have it over with. And it was really interesting because I, I, the judge said, okay, you guys have to go try to work it out. And he made them come back four different times. And one time, um, I think it was the third time, I, I saw Nora standing out you know, by a car. He was leaning on a car, he had his head down, he was all sulking. And, I was like, you know, Nora, what's wrong? And he said, she, you know, she wants, she wants me to get her yams. I can't afford yams. I can only afford potatoes. I can't afford medicine for her. My own brother was sick. I had to get medicine for him. And, you know, he really felt that um, he had done all he could and he was annoyed at her mom. And it was just this very um, interesting, you know, he, he had his own set of complaints. But the fact was that Zalika wanted to work and he refused to let her. He refused to let her go out and earn a living. And I forgot, let me see if I can show you. There's Zalika also with her baby. And so um, finally, I, he just got fed up. That, that day when I saw him with his head down, he said, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm sick of coming here. I'm just gonna give her a divorce. And so she came back um, the next day, she and Nora came back with her baby and the judge decided to grant her a divorce. And, you know, divorce, Zalika was very, very happy and thrilled. And divorce wasn't going to be easy. You know, she was going to have to go back home and live with her family. She was happy to do that. Um, 
but she also risked losing custody of her baby. Um, once the baby turned four, the, the rules were very much in the man's favor in the society. Um, but the, that, that didn't mean that was a guarantee. Um, but the last time I talked to Zalika, she was getting ready to get married and again, and this time to a man she loved and a man who loved her back. And so um, in the end, it was a happy story for Zalika. Uh, next, I'm going to tell you about a woman called Rahila. So I went to the far north of Cameroon to write about Boko Haram. And I'll step back and tell you a little bit about Boko Haram. Um, Boko Haram was a group of Islamic extremists who, like many other terrorist groups, started out fighting government neglect and corruption, and things kind of spiraled out of control. Um, they were operating in an area in the northeast of Nigeria that bordered Cameroon and Niger and Chad. And so it, the conflict kind of spilled over into those areas too. Um, when they first started out, uh, they were living in this area, which is still the case, with, with very little electricity, no paved roads, um, you know, people didn't have enough to eat, yet government officials were living in mansions with nice cars and flaunting around their money and sending their kids off to Europe and America, off to the West, you know, to be educated. And then their kids would come back and take on the same jobs that their parents had and do the exact same thing. The cycle would start all over. They were basically stealing money from poor people because the poor people were expected to pay taxes, but they saw no benefit from that. And so um, Boko Haram started out rallying against that. And Boko Haram's, the, the name means loosely, Western education is forbidden. And you can see why this group of, you know, uneducated men would kind of really rail against Western education when they thought that maybe, you know, what are they teaching those kids who would come over and just like their parents, you know, come back home from the West and steal money from the poor people. And so um, what happened with Boko Haram, um, how it turned so violent was their charismatic leader called Muhammad Yusuf was um, detained by the police and shot. He was killed. He was extrajudicially murdered. And Boko Haram, um, the group got very violent and it really hasn't stopped since then. So that's my two minute, um, very brief explanation of a complicated group. So I hope you'll tolerate that. Um, so by the time I got onto the beat in West Africa, I felt like my colleague had written every story there was to tell um, about Boko Haram. And so I, I went to the far north because the, of Cameroon because there was one very, very troubling new aspect that was happening. And that was the advent of women suicide bombers. They were turning up more and more and no one could figure it out. How could, you know, women who had very little power, who had very little, you know, role in society, how could they be so devout and dedicated to Boko Haram? They would be willing to give up their lives and kill other people. So, um, you know, there have been groups in the past that had deployed women's suicide bombers, the Tamil Tigers and some others, but, um, you know, not like this. Um, there were more of them and it didn't, you know, it didn't really make sense. Um, everyone thought they must just be incredible diehard devout members, but I met Rahila by chance in a refugee camp outside the city of Marwa and uh, it was a sprawling, just massive, massive camp where all kinds of people from Nigeria had spilled across the border, um, fleeing Boko Haram. And I just sat down and like I did with every interview, just asked, you know, the, the subjects to tell me how they ended up in this camp. And she started telling me that she was living in a town that had been taken over by Boko Haram. She was kidnapped and taken to a camp. And she told me when I got there, I saw so many women. There were just scores of women everywhere. They were all been taken um, hostage by Boko Haram. And so the conditions there were really, really bad. Um, they didn't have enough food. She lost a ton of weight. One day they put all the women in a truck and drove them out to an old abandoned flour mill. And they said, okay, um, I want you to walk in there and look at who's in there. And when you see them, realize that if you obey us and do what we say, you can be just like them. 
And what they saw inside were a group of girls that um, Rahila realized right away were the Chibot girls. And those are um, girls who started that bring back our girls um, hashtag that Ma Michelle Obama had held up and um, they were kidnapped from a school. I'll tell you more about them later, but the main point here is they were really, really plump, um, almost chubby. And that was really, really tantalizing for these women, Boko Haram thought, because they thought they would see them say, oh, we'll get a lot to eat if we do what we say. So they took the women back to camp and they started putting them through this very systemic training. Um, Rahila described it to me like first grade, second grade, third grade. And first grade that she told me was, um, she called it primary one. They would give them sticks and train them as though the sticks were guns, you know, pretend that the sticks were guns and show them how to hold the weapon and how to shoot. The second stage was beheading. Um, they would teach them to behead victims. They like to tell them to chop from the back of the neck. That's how they behead animals in that part of the country. And that was um, the second level of their training. The third level of their training was suicide bomber training. And they told them, you know, tuck the, tuck the bomb. Um, if it's a vest, you know, keep your armpit really steady because then it won't detonate quickly or w when you don't want it to um, prematurely. And so Rahila looked around and had enough of that. And she one night um, in the middle of the night managed to flee and run away and um, get away from it all. She grabbed her, her kids and she even had a couple of grandkids and fled through the, the desert, um, the really scrubby area in that part of the country and wound up at this refugee camp. And so I wrote a story about her and found it really, really intriguing that that was, you know, this training was going on. Um, but more bombings were happening and more women, women were carrying them out. And what was even more troubling was more teenage girls were carrying them out even kids as young as eight years old. And some of these women had babies strapped to their backs. There were explosions happening more and more frequently. A polo field in the city of Maiduguri where Boko Haram um, had started in Nigeria, a polo field was a target, a university, gate, the gates of a university, the University of Maiduguri was a frequent, just constantly getting bombed. Um, I remember one day a veterinarian professor a professor of, you know, a veterinary professor had died. Um, he had been on his way to pray at the mosque that morning and he got caught up in a bombing and, and died. Um, they were bombing markets and mosques. I was even reporting there one night and you know, woke up in the middle of the night because that bombing had like shaken me in my bed. I mean, it was just over and over this was happening. So um, I'm gonna show you the next set of images. Um, the military line, that they had told everyone was that all these women and girls were brainwashed. Brainwashed was a word they loved to use. And you know, what did that even mean? I had no idea. It sounded like a weird excuse. It just couldn't even understand what they meant when they said that. And meanwhile, it was so bad in Maiduguri where all these, all these bombings were happening that women were, were stigmatized just for being women. Um, people literally would be walking down the street and come upon a woman and they would cross the street to get away from them because they were terrified that the women were gonna blow up the bomb because they wore these long hijabs, they wore you know dresses under them. Um, you couldn't tell what a woman had underneath her robe. And so, the the um, bomber girls, the girls who were, who were setting off a lot of the bombs were dirty because they had been living in the bush with Boko Haram in a camp where they didn't have access to water or um, food, you know, so they were kind of skinny and haggard looking was the word they used. So a lot of the women in my degree told me that they made sure to wear very nice clothes and to bathe regularly because they didn't want to be mistaken for a suicide bomber. It was, it was, in crazy time in my degree. Um, women started curtsying when they would come up to a checkpoint, which were stationed all over town. Um, they would, uh, my degree is like this college town. It kind of always reminded me of Minneapolis, like a college town in the middle of farming fields and, you know, with a lot of good art and music and dance and that kind of thing. Um, 
but, but there were checkpoints all over town and women would squat down and curtsy when they would come upon the soldiers because they realized, they, they figured the soldiers would think that if they were able to curtsy, then they didn't have a bulky um, suicide vest on or a belt on that would be likely to expo explode. And so that's how they got around town. But some women were literally shot on sight when they would approach a checkpoint. Um, kids too, so girls. Um, so there, it was very, very risky just being a woman in this city. So I went to my degree to the site of all these bombings to figure out what was going on. And I was driving around and um, with my, my fixer, the local journalist I worked with and my dear friend, Shehu Abubakar. And we were driving in a car and passed a billboard. And I was like, wait, slow down. And we, it was on a round point. We went around like six times so I could figure out what was going on. But it was a giant picture of a wild-eyed little girl who had bombs strapped all over to her body and she was like you know had this scary face or whatever and the the message of the billboard was parents don't give away your children to Boko Haram to be suicide bombers and I was just looked at it I'm like what they like what it made no sense at all to me because who would give your kid away to become a bomber to blow themselves up and kill other people. I mean, I have kids. I mean, I, you know, it just made absolutely no sense to me. And I said, Shehu, we have got to get to the bottom of this. We have to find some of these women. And so we talked to our security sources and Shehu knew all kinds of people. And I talked to some people and we managed to find 18 different girls. And I call them girls because they were all teenagers, 18 girls who had been dispatched by Boko Haram um, to become suicide bombers and had found a way to surrender in, in sometimes very clever ways. And so I'm gonna use my notes here. So I'm gonna go on and show you a few of these girls as I talk, but we, we took these girls to safe houses and hotel rooms. And this was actually in the back of a Chinese restaurant. Um, anywhere we felt that would keep them safe and allow them to tell us their stories. The stigma was so huge at my degree. Anyone who had spent time with Boko Haram was considered a suspect, even if you were captured, even if you were there against your will, um, and especially if you were a woman. So these girls started telling us their stories. Um, all of them obviously had been kidnapped. Many of them had seen their parents decapitated in front of them. Um, they sometimes some of them had seen brothers who had been killed um, or or spirited away to you know I guess join Boko Haram and be conscripted into the fight um, and almost all of them had been asked if they wanted to but once they got to the camp um, do you want to marry a fighter and you know some factions of Boko Haram raped women but there were some of some of the factions didn't they decided that they needed to that islam required them to ask permission to be married and of course it wasn't marriage it was it was rape but they would ask these women if they wanted to be married and if the woman said no they would say okay we have a job for you and they would tie a suicide belt to them and uh it was it was a really, I mean, they were, they were terrified and they often couldn't, you know, they, they didn't know what to do. So, and they would tell the girls, they would tell them, um, oh, you're going to go straight to heaven if you push the detonator. Um, one, one time, one girl told me, they told them, oh, if you push the detonator, the bomb will leap from your body and it won't hurt you. It will just hurt other people. And, you know, they, they would tell them all kinds of things um, to make them think that this was the right thing to do. And then they would drive these girls who had no idea where they were um, because they had been kidnapped and had never even left their village and would drive them out into the middle of nowhere, plop them on a road, put a gun to their head and say, walk to this market, walk to this checkpoint, walk to this mosque and push the button. And oftentimes they would send the girls out in groups of two or three um, to help maximize, you know, I guess the, the number of victims. And so I started asking the girls, you know, what did you think when you were walking along that road? And many of them told me they had considered, they, they were so traumatized and upset, they had considered going off into the bush and just blowing themselves up because they were so 
horrified at the fact that, you know, they were being asked to kill other people. Um, some of the girls, you know, had approached other people and, you know, along the way that they'd met on the road, one girl, you know, terrified an old man. She's like, I have a bomb. And the guy ran away screaming and she was really stressed out. And then he told other people and the whole crowd was screaming at her. And she anyway managed to finally get to a soldier who helped her um, take the bomb off. But another girl told me she walked into a mosque just kind of uncertain what she was going to do and spotted her uncle in the crowd and walked up to him and said, I have a bomb. You have to help me. And he said, don't tell anyone. And he quick and he got her out of there because he knew if anyone knew that she would be killed because people, you know, were so suspicious and, and would have thought that she was a killer, not a little girl who had a bomb strapped to her. And he walked her to a police office um, where the, the officers took the bombs off for her. Um, so I sat there and listened for days to these girls telling me these stories. And um, one, one of them in particular was pretty terrifying. Um, a one, one young woman had told me she had been drugged um, and woke up, kind of, kind of like came to, you know, out of her fuzziness as she was walking on the road with two other girls. And she looked over and the girl beside her had a baby strapped to her back and a bomb strapped to her belly. Um, and so did this girl and so did the girl to her right. And so the three of them with the, these bombs and the baby were walking and talking about what to do. They talked about suicide. Um, but then they decided that they would risk it and they would raise their arms to soldiers. And as happened in many cases, they would raise their arms to soldiers and tell them that they had a bomb and beg them to take it off of them. So that was their plan. And um, the three were walking along and the girl, one of the girls, I think she was quite young, um, said, I have to go to the bathroom before we do this. I'm gonna go behind this tree. She walks over to the tree and squats down and her bomb goes off accidentally. The soldiers who weren't that far away came running toward them all. And um, the girl with the baby on her back got completely terrified and dropped the baby. Um, some, uh, the girl I talked to didn't know if it was accidental or on purpose you know, to get away. Um, she thought maybe it was an accident, but the baby fell off her back she ran out into the bush and the baby was laying there crying and the girl i had talked to looked down at the baby and it reminded her of her own baby who had died just a couple of weeks before um had died of starvation in the camp it was she had been raped and it was her baby um who had died and so she picks up the baby while she still has a belt tied around her and breastfeeds the baby because she still had milk in her breasts. And when I met her, um, she was telling me this story and I said, what happened to the baby? And she said, oh, I, I have the baby, um, she's mine. And she went over and we went to her house. She was living in a, in a refugee camp, an IDP camp. Um, we went to her house um, and she showed me this little girl who was about three years old. And I said, have you told her, you know, what happened to her mom? She said, no, I will never tell her. She will never know what happened to her. But I thought it was really incredible that she had adopted this baby and um, taken care of her. So um, one thing that I tried to do after all these horrifying stories was really to balance out um, the awful stories with other parts of life because Africa is a place that often the media perpetuates stereotypes of, of being only about war and only about disease and only about famine and only about wild animals. And obviously, you know, it's a place of however many countries and cultures and languages and, you know, all kinds of things happen in these individual countries that are normal and regular and there's poetry and um, art and painting and music and dance and you know economic stories and political stories just like we have here obviously and so i felt i had this responsibility to tell the news when it was bad and let me actually see oh here's another i'm going to show you these other images which i forgot to do sorry this is one of my favorites um of these girls 
uh, okay. So I felt I had this responsibility to tell the news um, when it was bad because I worked for the New York Times and powerful people listen to the New York Times. Presidents read my stories. Um, the UN reads my stories. Diplomats read my stories. But um, I also had a responsibility to balance it out. And so this is Shay Shay, and she is an Afrobeat star in Nigeria, in Lagos. And I went to Lagos to interview pop stars um, about copyright issues. So what was happening in um, Nigeria has an amazing music scene, you know, probably you've all heard of Felakuti and, um, and beyond. So uh, there are many, many Afrobeat stars there who are working really hard um, in a really tough climate. I mean, they rely on revenue from concerts and weirdly from ringtones. Um, the, the big telecom companies were some of the only functioning revenue streams that they had. And there's no, you know, there's no Apple Music, there's no Spotify, at least there wasn't when I was there a couple years ago. Um, and so these artists really did rely on CD sales, but people were ripping them off constantly. Everywhere on the streets, you could buy bootleg copies of their CDs. And, you know, I went to a market, a CD market, where the bootleggers were complaining about new kinds of bootleggers who were using little flash drives to rip off the music. And so it was just this counterfeiting scene was out of control. So I went and hung out with Shay Shay um, to just see, like I went, this is on the set of MTV. She was shooting a video. I went to a concert backstage with her. Um, I hung out at her apartment and we just really wanted to you know, explore um, what life was like for a Nigerian um, pop star. And I have to tell you one funny story about Shay Shay's. Um, she had hired these guys who she called, um, or who they called themselves her bag men. You know, they would, the guy holding the phone in this photo is one of them. Um, and he's lovely. Um, but uh, they were, you know, they would just run little errands for her. And so we were up in a hotel room where, of a hotel where she was going to perform and she was getting her makeup done and her hair and it was this elaborate hours long process i've never seen so much makeup applied it was really fascinating on its own and um her bag men um these two guys like to smoke a lot of weed and they were smoking a lot of weed and shay shay was going to be performing without a band she was supposed to just have she had a little flash drive with the music so they would just plug it in and then she'd sing you know to the music track and she needed to have one of the bag men go downstairs to give it to the backstage guys to, you know, have it ready to go. And she hands it to the guy and he leaves and he does not come back for seriously like 90 minutes. We're all like, where is Kobe? What is going on? And he stumbles into the room. And as it turns out, he had been at the, the hotel was one of those, had those elevators where you needed a key card to press the button to get up to a room. And he was in the elevator, stoned out of his mind for like an hour, basically playing Russian roulette because he had forgot his key card. And, and like this form of Russian roulette, just waiting for the elevator to stop on the floor. He'd just been in this little container like for an hour. And um, anyway, and he also just, it, the whole show got kind of bungled because Shay Shay goes on to sing and he had given the wrong flash drive to the guy and she opens her mouth and her own voice comes out. So she was basically lip syncing the whole time and it was really embarrassing, um, but no one seemed to mind. Everybody loved it and she's lovely. She ended up, um, last year she came to South by Southwest to tour. Um, She's trying to tour, well, she was trying to tour before the pandemic hit. I had helped her um, write a visa letter to go on tour in America, so I hope that works out for her. Um, so um, that's our little nice break here. Um, so I'm going to go back to Boko Haram and tell you a little bit about um, some of the girls called the Chibot Girls and that I had mentioned earlier. Um, these are a set of 250 girls who were kidnapped from a tiny village of Chibok where they were um, going to, they were spending the night for exams. They were going to school there. And this created the bring back our girls hashtag um, that was popular. Like I said, Michelle Obama held a sign. Um, there were protests all over the world. When the images of these girls were broadcast by Boko Haram, just all these like, you know, 
250 girls in dark hijab sitting under a tree um, looking really sad and terrified. And that is how the world knew the Chibot girls is, is looking at them like that. So the soldiers, fast forward, what, two, three years later, three or four years later, um, one of the girls had been found just rummaging through the forest. And then the government wound, of Nigeria wound up um, doing a hostage swap with some Boko Haram commanders for about 100 or so of the girls. So half of the girls got released. And the world was very excited. Their parents, as you can imagine, were thrilled, but they were immediately detained. And they were paraded before the president and the media. And then they were stuck in some facility, um, allegedly for questioning, or I'm not quite sure for what, but their parents couldn't see them or spend ample time with them. Um, no one really knew what was going on with them. They were just squirreled away. And I have to tell you, um, the, you know, I had, I had, you know, been working at the Times for a few years and the Chibok girls, I think like a lot of us who had covered this story had this really weird relationship to them because we'd heard all these horrible, horrible stories from other women. And I kept thinking back to, um, to what Rahila had told me and about how these girls had been, you know, kept relatively well compared to other hostages. They were, the, I mean, Boko Haram knew they had these celebrity hostages and so they treated them better. Now, it, well, obviously it was horrible for them. But when, when we heard, I mean, before the Chiba girls were kidnapped, there were 200 or 100 or so, some little boys who were burned alive in a school by Boko Haram, and no one has ever heard of that story. So um, it was this weird, like, wow, kind of feeling that, that I think a lot of us had when we were writing about the Chiba girls. Um, but detaining them for that long by their own government and, their, and talking to the parents and hearing the heartache of these poor parents who just felt like the government had done them so wrong um, in so many ways, neglecting to find them and, and everything. It was just really awful. And so finally the girls were released. They were women now. Um, they were released to uh, the American University in Yola, Nigeria. Um, <clears throat> it, was a, it was a big university for elites and they were given this just completely charmed setup. Um, they had Wi-Fi and air conditioned dorms and iPads and were promised this education that would catch them up um, in all their high school studies and then would also, um, you know, they could go to college there if they wanted to stay on. So for free, it was all um, a gov government funded. And, it sounded really wonderful. And I, you know, went into the story, I went to visit them at the university thinking like, oh wow, these charmed girls. And got there and found that in fact they they were this really weird situation. They were treated like little kids. Um, there were like Spider-Man signs up and you know, posters up all over. And they um, were counseled, were given counseling, but the counseling was only in English and none of them could speak very good English. So they weren't really getting any therapy like the university had said. Um, and also they were not allowed to leave campus. They were basically hostages of this campus in this weird way. One girl, uh, one young woman even had um, her father was in a hospital outside of campus. And by the time that the university organized a um, security detail to go with her to the hospital. The father had been discharged and died. Um, so these w poor women were just living these lives that were just as captive, you know, as, as I mean, their whole, ever since school, ever since they were kidnapped that night, they had been captive in some form or another and probably, you know, will be the rest of their lives to some degree. And I just realized that they were symbols for the rest of the women and the, the nameless and faceless women and men and children you know, who had all been victimized by Boko Haram. And we ran these portraits of them. And if I had a way to do moving images, it would be great because there were these cascading portraits of them um, in the newspaper of 80 some of them, all of them who had wanted to um, be photographed. And these are photographs by Adam Ferguson. And I can tell you the names of the other photographers too, which I neglected to do. Um, 
Laura Bushnack and Adam Ferguson and Ash Gilbertson are all, all other amazing photographers that I worked with and that I'm showing you images of here. So uh, the next person I want to tell you about is a woman called Fatih Abubakar. And Fatih makes me smile because she's become a good friend and I think she's just wonderful. But um, I first met her in 2016 and she's a local girl from my degree. She's a photojournalist and she started taking pictures of people in, in my degree, just regular people just on the streets and did uh, created an Instagram called Bits of Borno, which is kind of like Humans of New York, if you know that Instagram account. And Fatih is wonderful. And she just really, she was a woman photojournalist, which kind of didn't exist in my degree then and not so much even now. So she was a bit of a sensation around town. And, you know, she's walking around through markets that had been blown up in the past. Um, by a group of men who treated women as sex slaves or weapons and just walking around with her camera, taking pictures of people. I just thought she had so much courage. But um, one thing that I thought I could really relate to for her, I remember um, I was in Manhattan on September 11th working as a journalist and I remember calling a friend finally after, if you, if you were in Manhattan, then um, Around you know the phone lines were were not very good, but I finally got through to someone that day, a uh, former or another journalist who was a friend of mine, and I remember him. I was a young reporter, and he said to me, "Everyone you meet today is going to have an incredible story, because this is an incredible event. Like don't don't not talk to anyone." And it just reminded me of Fatih and what she was doing. She realized that in this in her hometown of my degree, where Boko Haram started where you know, suicide bombings were happening, where all these terrible things had happened, everyone had an incredible story to tell because everyone's life had been touched by war to some degree. And I thought she was just totally incredible. So um, I wanna tell you about one more woman um, that I met. This is Balaraba. Uh, and her story is incredible. Um, I met her right after I had um, written the story, and the story had been published about the 18 girls, the women suicide bombers. Um, I, I didn't quite know what to do with her. Her story was amazing, but I had already told the story of bombers. And so I just kind of sat on the story for a long, long time until I finally found a way to get it in the paper. And that was with an incredible statistic about how more than 500 women and girls that I discovered um, this stat had been deployed as suicide bombers. So, and, and that didn't even consider people like Balaraba who had managed to find very, very clever ways out of, out of becoming a suicide bomber. Um, so can you imagine, you know, if even one person in America, one teenage girl was found with a suicide bomb strapped to her and or approached police and, and surrendered or something. I mean, it would be a huge news story. And there were more than 500 girls in this region that this had happened to. I mean, way more than that. And I found that to be true when I would go report, I would just start asking women, so did, you know, who had been captured by Boko Haram, so did Boko Haram ever strap a suicide bomb to you? Yeah, 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 they did. And they would tell me about this. But Balaraba was so incredible because of the way that she had got out of this. And I know we're almost out of time, so I'll go quick. Um, so she had outsmarted Boko Haram on a number of occasions. She had been kidnapped. Her husband had been killed in front of her. Her baby had been thrown on the ground. And um, she thought her baby was dead. It was a newborn. Boko Haram had invaded her house, taken, taken her off um, to their camp. And they were actually, her husband had criticized Boko Haram, some of his friends who had joined, and so they were getting revenge. So um, he had made the mistake of saying that he thought Boko Haram was terrible. They took her, they knew she was an educated girl, they hated her all the more for that, and she thought her baby was dead, she knew her husband was dead. And they took her to a camp where um, Boko Haram was making suicide belts and bombs. And um, at the camp, two, two men got into a fight one night and went into the bomb storage locker. And one, one of the guys set off a bunch of bombs and, and killed a bunch of people in the camp. 
the fighters wanted revenge. Um, they didn't care on who, they just wanted to, to do something um, and use their bombs to make a point. So they grabbed Balaraba along with, I think it was five other women, four or five other women, sent them out um, with bonds and told them to blow up a market. And Balaraba um, and the girls were walking along just like the other girls and trying to figure out what to do with their bonds. They talked about suicide. They talked about maybe burying the bonds. They talked about hiding them in a dam and they walked by a well. And they said, huh, um, maybe we should throw our bonds down this well. And they stood there looking down into the well, trying to figure out if it had water in it, trying to figure out how deep it was, talked about, you know, what are the physics of this? What's the likelihood we're going to get killed if we do this? One of them suggested lowering one of the little girls with them. There was a girl about 12 or so with them. Thought, oh, we'll lower her down in there. And Bella was like, no, that's a stupid idea. We can't do that. So they decided, though, to take off their hijabs and tie them together in a string and lower and, and put all the bombs together in a little thermos that they were carrying with them and lower the bombs into the well. And they did this and the bombs did not go off and they sprinted back to camp. And, and they got back to camp and told the fighters, mission accomplished, we've done it, we're good. Um, you know, we blew up, we did exactly what you said. They had gone back to camp because they didn't want to go into town. They knew they'd be stigmatized and maybe even shot just being women, unfamiliar women. Um, they also didn't know where they were. So they ran back to camp, told Boko Haram they did it, and the fighters cheered. They were really excited. They're like, oh, these, these girls did it. And they're like, wait, wait a minute. We haven't heard any news reports about this because they all were addicted to their radios. You know, they didn't hear anything. And Balarabba says, I swear on the Quran, we did it. They bring out a Quran for her to swear. She puts her hand on it. She says, we did it. And um, they said, okay, yay. And so they celebrated these women as heroes. And they had a big feast and they, you know, said, okay, you're our new fighters. They, um, then they said, you're ready for weapons training. And they took all the girls and lined them up and said, we're going to have you do some live target practice. And the girls are like, what? And they brought out hostages that they didn't like and um, lined them up and told the girls to shoot at them. And they started shooting at them. And the, the, one of the girls, the little girl um, who was with Balaraba, um, who they talked about lowering down at the well, was so distraught that she just ran into the fire and killed herself in the fire. And so um, this was a terrible, terrible situation. Uh, women were being raped all the time, um, deployed as suicide bombers. Balaraba decided to feign mental illness. And this is very, very common. A lot of the women had um, that we met would say that they acted like they were so-called crazy so they could get out of fighting. Balarabha would start screaming, yes, yes, you're right, keep killing them. Boko Haram is, is amazing. Western education is forbidden. And would do all these kinds of things to get out of, to make them leave her alone. And they did for a large part. They thought she was insane. They thought she was also really sick. She would pretend like she was sick. And so time and time again, um, Boko Haram would send her out on missions. They, they would, would send her, they strapped a bomb to her, or they, I'm sorry, they handed her a bomb in a, in a bag and told her and other girls again to go blow up a, a mosque this time. And the girls again threw their bombs in a well and managed to trick Boko Haram. They, they sent Balaraba out another time. Um, they were trying to, you know, get the bomb on her and make her go out. And she told them that she had a stomach ache and she couldn't go. She, she basically feigned diarrhea and, and that was her way out of it. Um, another time they strapped a bomb to her and took her and a bunch of girls to the Monday market in my degree, which is the biggest market in the city and told her that she should blow up the market. And that time, Balaraba really was sick. Um, she thinks she had malaria and she could not even get out of the car. She was so weak. And they drove her back to camp, but they did bomb the market that day and all sped away. Um, so Balaraba, um, skipping to the end of her story, she got back to camp and the fighters, she they locked her in a room with some other girls. and. 
the fighters, she could hear them scampering about and talking about how a group of civilian vigilante forces were on their way. These are just local, local people who had taken up the fight against Boko Haram. And the fighters got really, really worried about Balaraba, um, about, about the um, incoming invasion of their camp. And Balaraba essentially just blacked out and woke up and was on fire. And literally, the, the fighters had bombed their own camp to distract the civilian vigilantes who were running after and invading their camp. And it worked. I mean, the, the civilian fighters got there and found body parts. They found um, Balaraba on fire and they dragged her out. And I'll show you a picture. This Balaraba has scars all over her. They dragged her out and a woman fighter who had joined the civilian vigilante forces because her sister, had um, also been kidnapped and she wanted revenge, rescued Balaraba. And the beautiful thing about Balaraba's story is that that woman named Hadiza stayed with Balaraba through the hospital and is still best friends with her today and basically adopted her as, as her sister um, to replace the sister that she had lost. And I, I kept finding this over and over in my reporting, how these amazing blended families would come together. and. But Balaraba had, was, was so incredible because she had managed to outsmart Boko Haram and get out of suicide bombings at least, at least four times, maybe more. And one amazing thing is Balaraba found that her, um, her daughter was in fact alive. And so she was reunited with her daughter and she decided that she wanted to become a nurse. This is Balaraba in her classroom where she is learning to become a nurse. And she said she wanted to become a nurse because she wanted to give back to all the people who helped her, who had um, taken so, so, such good care of her even when she didn't have money. And Balaraba, to this day, she um, still walks around with a first aid kit by her side, just in case someone needs help. And in fact, I got a WhatsApp message from her today. She sent me a picture of her little girl um, called Hayrat, and so Balarab is doing really well. So I wanted to leave you just with a nice, positive, and happy story about baobab trees, um, which has nothing to do with women, but I think these images by Tomas Munita are really beautiful. And this was a story I worked on with Tomas where we just drove around and talked to people about how much they love the baobab tree in their village. And we discovered all these wonderful, these women were out picking leaves um, to make stew from the baobab tree and just how, how it was used. You know, people make smoothies with the fruit from the baobab. Um, they, you can see in the bottom of that tree, they cut the, the bark at the bottom of the tree to make rope. Um, it's, you know, the, the landscape, I mean, you can see here, it's pretty flat. So a baobab is really like a waypoint. There are no mountains or rivers. And so this is the only thing really um, in almost the whole country that people use to guide them as they're traveling. And even in the olden days, kings would use them as storage lockers and would store their, um, all their belongings as they would travel across the countryside in the hollowed interior of the trees. And you can see it's the only shady spot around. It's really beautiful. Um, and people use them almost as community centers or like gathering spots for naming ceremonies for babies or meetings, you know, the mayor and the leaders of the town. And these, this, this guy was letting his sheep have a break there. And they're just these images of real beauty and weirdness. And, you know, they're not like the grand Madagascar um, baobab trees, but they're these squatty, ugly, yet beautiful things that I thought were really great. And so I wanted to leave you with that. And that's all I have for you. So I'd love to take some questions. Jan, thank you so much. That was a fantastic talk. And I'm especially so grateful that you ended with the baobab trees <laughs> because, um, wow, those are a lot of intense stories that you shared and that you've obviously experienced. Um, I, I guess, I, so I just want to, I'll remind people that um, we'd love for you to be involved in the Q&A at, at this stage. And if you move your cursor, cursor down near the bottom of your screen, uh, assuming you're on a desktop or laptop or something, there's a Q&A 
button that you can use to type in questions. And I think there's also a raise hand option. And if you use that, I think I'll get a notification and be able to unmute you and then you can ask your question directly. Um, I want to ask the question, how do you, how do you inure, inure yourself to these like incredibly traumatic um, stories and experiences um, involving people who you obviously become close with and whose lives you're invested in? I just felt like it was such a privilege to get to, you know, learn these people's stories and to hear, you know, a lot of these, especially the, the really sad stories, um, the Boko Haram stories, they'd never told anybody. They'd never told their moms or their husbands, or maybe they told one person, you know, and they really recognize the fact that by telling, you know, I, I mean, I had this privilege of being an international reporter and by telling an international reporter, maybe I could bring change to them. And, you know, I think, I think that some of my stories, I hope changed the narrative on, you know, these, these suicide bombers and how the outside world at least saw them. I mean, there's still huge stigmatization of them, but I think, you know, they weren't brainwashed. That was ridiculous. And I just felt like, it was it was um, such a privilege to be able to tell those stories and in Balaraba's case I mean one one thing is amazing working about the New York Times is readers um, wrote in to help her she couldn't afford I mentioned in the story she couldn't afford um, nursing school tuition and readers donated some, some seven thousand more than seven thousand dollars to her I mean she's got a bank account and a house and so it's it's really great well, it's, um, you obviously are really mindful of the responsibility that you have, and um, we can only thank you for doing that, the work that you do. Um, there are a number of questions that uh, people have typed in, so I, I want to um, pass those along. Uh, the first one's not a question. It says, great job, Dion, from your favorite sister. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. <laughs> Um, Dion, can you talk about how West Africans are dealing with shelter in place issues, shelter in place issues? Wow. Um, so I stopped covering, um, I stopped covering West Africa, you know, in, in August, um, more or less, but I did work on a story about how a lot of Americans recently were deciding to stay in West Africa because they seem to have a much better grip on things than, America. <laughs> so, you know, that they were doing testing and Senegal's doing way more testing um, than America has been doing. Um, the health system is, you know, not wonderful in a lot of these countries, but um, I have a lot of experience with the Senegalese health system and, you know, it's tricky, but I think people are so far being smart and staying inside. My friends tell me there that you know, they're, they're staying in and trying to do social distancing as much as they can. But, you know, we had a story in the front page today that talked about how across the world, you know, people who are hungry are just going to get hungrier. I mean, we're seeing in America how, you know, the disparities are just glaring. And I think that's, if the virus takes off more in places like West Africa, it's going to be a huge problem. But for now, it's, it's been better than here. Thank you. Um, I think I'm getting a, a, a note from Jessica. I have several other questions that people have typed in. I think I'm also getting a note from Jessica that there are people who are using the raised hand function, but I'm not sure that I'm, I'm seeing that. So Jessica, if you are and you're able to bring those people into the conversation, will you please do that? Hi, this is Jessica, and I see that we have a question from Amy. So, Amy, I'm going to unmute mute you. It's Amy Kilmer. Amy, you have, uh, oh, oh, not letting me unmute. Um, I see we also have a question from Amy. I'm going to allow her to talk. Hmm. Uh, so maybe that rate, maybe we're having some, uh, some difficulty with the raised hand option. We Let are. See if I can, I, um, yeah, I think we're not figuring out how to unmute you. I'm so sorry about that. Um, what I'm going to suggest is try um, typing in your question, please, instead using the Q&A box until we um, hopefully sort that out. And um, in the meantime, we have a few others that have been typed in. 
So uh, the question, Dion, is are the women not in fear of retribution being recognized and having revenge taken on them for having escaped? Or are they, quote, free to live their new lives? And is there access to mental health care for them? Those are all really good questions. I mean, we considered that very, very carefully before we ever named anyone or showed their um, their face. So um, we, with Balaraba, um, we talked to Balaraba. We talked to two. My my fixer Shehu Abubakar. Um, I worked. He knew her quite well for several years. Um, I had met her. I even knew her for a few years before I wrote about her and. We had um, decided, and then Shehu actually unfortunately died um, before the story came out because he had some kidney problems. But um, a, another fixer I also worked with who also got to know Balaraba, I talked to you know really everybody I could to make sure that it was a smart idea to show her face and use her name. And we decided that enough time had passed. Um, you know, this was like maybe four or five or more years ago when the worst of the worst happened to her. Um, there's going to be stigma, of course, in the community because that still exists, but she'd already been managing that. Um, her neighbors had shunned her. Her uncle had kicked her out. I mean, she was just kind of living with that, which is unfortunate. But are there mental health? Um, I mean, honestly, I kind of felt like sometimes I was a mental health provider, you know, just these women. I mean, even even my, my dear friend Shehu, we would, you know, be talking to some of the women and they would cry and he would say, oh, don't cry, you know, just forget about it. And like, Shehu, come on, let him cry. <laughs> so, you know, um, I think that the mental health care was often, you know, just forget about it and move on. And, um, but there, you know, Balaraba had some mental health issues and she had seen, um, she had been in a hospital, a, a mental health ward of a hospital for a little while and had seen um, counselors there, but the stigma just permeates every aspect of life. I mean, there, there's not like, you know, there's not like a therapist for her to go to every week or something like that. I mean, it, it's pretty rough. I can imagine. Uh, another question is uh, from Tita. How do you think you may influence the women you encounter, either consciously or unconsciously? Well, unconsciously, I don't know. I mean, I did, I did have the chance to meet some of the um, bomber girls again. And it was, I, I remember one girl in particular told me that she wanted to be a journalist. I thought it was so sweet. She was really young and she had met me and she thought that my job was cool. So I was really excited about that. But um, I don't know, you know, I think that in some ways I feel like I was a bit of an alien, you know, like coming from America from a big newspaper and just dropping in and then leaving again. I mean, that part of the job feels really kind of awful, but um, I was really heartened that when I worked with Shehu and then um, the the other fixer after him, um, he was really wonderful. Uh, Alpha is his name. Um, they were both really, really wonderful in following up with the women that we talked to. Shehu was just in touch with everybody, every single person I interviewed, he would give me updates about. I mean, he just knew everyone and was really constantly in touch with them, even though I couldn't be. So. I don't know. I always tried to make sure that people knew, you know, what was written about them. And, um, and a lot of, a lot of people did get help from, you know, individuals got help after um, the stories appeared, but, um, but I, I don't know really what to say, how, how, you know, what impression I left on them. Mm -hmm. um, here, a question from William. You talked about the surprisingly feminist judge in the chair. Uh, were there other bright spots? Were there areas whose traditional culture was relatively non-patriarchal to start with? Mm, boy, that's a, a tricky one. I'm going to have to think about. I'm sure there are other examples like that. Um, oh, well, okay, here's something. Um, I think this isn't exactly <laughs> addressing your question, but um, you know, West African fabric is really beautiful and colorful and interesting. And you, you know, at first the patterns seem like little swirls of, you know, I don't know, squiggles or whatever, but you look closely at the patterns and you can see um, some of them have these very, very feminist themes, which I thought were really fun. Um, one of them is called La Famille, uh, the, the family, and it's a, it's a hen's head in the middle with eggs around it and then 
a rooster, like disembodied rooster heads all over around the fabric. And it's meant to symbolize that the woman is the center of the family and the man just kind of like blah, around. <laughs> and um, I thought that was really great. And there are a few other examples. One is um, I fly, no, you fly, I fly, it's called. And it's uh, birds in a cage and flying out. And it's meant to symbolize if, if you cheat on me, I'm gonna cheat on you. So. Um, there were some really nice um, feminist themes in some of that fabric, and I thought that was great. That that was certainly something that was in the culture, you know, that people had known about for forever. Darcy asks, what was the biggest challenge as a woman journalist in Senegal? People ask me that a lot. I mean, I didn't really feel like I had a huge disadvantage or a challenge as a woman um, in most cases. I mean, you know, as an American in, especially in rural areas, as an American or a foreigner, you're already weird and different. And so it doesn't even matter what gender you are at that point, because you're just so different anyway from everybody else. And um, I think, you know, clearly it had an advantage in talking to some of the women um, about their sex lives or about uh, their, you know, their um, about being raped and those kinds of things. I think there's just no, no way around it that that's an advantage. And, and you know, I thought it was, I, I felt a huge responsibility in that way to talk about those things with them if they wanted to tell me. I, a follow up to that, are, were there topics that you might have been interested in getting into that you felt like because you're a woman, um, people wouldn't talk to you about mm -hmm. that? No, I think when you're a journalist, you really get over that right away. Like you just ask, <laughs> you know, you try that you just like you try and maybe there are things that people don't tell you because you're a woman. Um, I remember just joking with some guy in the Central African Republic about like, oh, I'm here. I I'm looking for a second husband. And, you know, he was like, you can't do that. Sex is no joke. Men are lions in the bedroom or whatever. I was like, oh, whatever. But, you know, so, I mean, you could even have funny conversations like that with men. I, d I just, you know, it's my job to ask questions and people seem to understand that. And um, you can really, there really are no, no taboo subjects or anything you can't ask about because people can just say no. Um, Elizabeth asks, do people of West Africa tend to believe that climate change is real? Or is it like in the US that some people don't believe the climate is really changing? You know, I was really, really surprised. It's a great question because I was out in Senegal in, in just the boonies, like in the middle of nowhere. And Tomas Munita and I, the photographer, pulled off the side of the road. And this guy comes out and starts talking to us about the fields and just like gives us this lecture on climate change. I mean, we were in the middle, you couldn't even get a cell phone signal. I mean, there were no schools, no anything. And he just knew everything about climate change and, and how, you know, and, and like we need to get better equipment that is more energy efficient out here. And, you know, just went on and on about how the climate, I, I mean, they're living it, you know, they're really living it out there. I mean, the, the crops were ankle high and normally that time of year, they're, you know, up to their waist. I mean, these are people who are down in it, in the thick of it more than us. And, you know, it's, it's really hard to deny when it's right in your face and they just, you know, the, the rainy season isn't that long. So when it changes, they really notice. About three more questions that have come in. Are you okay on, on time for that? Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, Jim says, thank you, Dion. I'm about halfway through your book and I'm loving it. You have a gift for revealing the humanity behind these often horrific headlines. When you were immersing yourself in these intense environments, do you feel that reality changes for you? Are you doing some type of compartmentalization, yet you're able to stay so connected? Can you talk about that? Yeah, I think reporters have this amazing gift for compartmentalization, you know, I mean, no matter what you're doing, but um, totally. I mean, I think in some ways, you know, I was also on my own away from my family. So you're just completely transformed into the worlds of other people and you're really immersed in their situation. I mean, I had no family responsibilities. I didn't have to feed the cat or the dog or, you know, anything like that. All I had to think about is the words that people were saying to me. And so I really tried to, 
you know, I, I talked to a class one time of kids and, and they were saying like, oh, I thought objective, you know, reporters aren't supposed to have empathy for anybody. And I was like, that's crazy. Like, that's the most important part of, you know, reporting is empathizing and understanding where people are coming from and what's going on with them and why they're doing the actions, you know, that they're taking, whether you agree with them or not. And I really feel like um, that was something that I tried to do, just really channel that empathy and, and, you know, compartmentalize it. And, and yeah, and, and it was really wild though, going back to a nice house and an apartment and screaming kids, you know, after hearing those stories, it was completely jarring and probably I'm messed up in some way that I don't know about it. So, but yeah, but I, I was really happy to get to tell those stories. Terry asks, can you clarify what you mean by fixer and the important role they, they yeah. obviously play? Sure, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, fixer is just, uh, so foreign reporters and, you know, often, often um, go into a situation knowing nothing. Um, that was me. I didn't know anything about anywhere where I was going. I'd never been there before. So we hire local journalists to sort of be our, our guides and make introductions um, and just kind of show us the lay of the land. And, you know, they're locals. They know the scene. They know the score. And you know, I, I really treated my, my fixers as friends and full colleagues and they were really helpful. They would often translate. Um, they would just kind of pave the way and tell you where to go and point you in different directions. And I, I just, you know, many of them became dear, dear friends, not all of them, but, but even I find even in my stories in America, um, I had a colleague who used to say, every story needs a shepherd. I mean, you need that one person when you're coming in cold, like American journalists who are generalists, not specialists for the most part, when you're coming into a story cold, you just need that one person to kind of take you by the hand and lead you around the, the story. And um, that's what I had to have there. And, and I love the, the fixers that I had so much in West Africa. Thanks for explaining that. I have two more uh, written in questions. We're going to get to those. I'm also going to try, there is someone with, who's trying valiantly the raised hand function. So I'm going to try with Dan and see if we can enable him to, uh, nope, I can't seem to make it work, but it looks like Dan has written in his question as well. So we'll do these three final questions and then I, I think we're going to have to end it there. Um, with just a, a couple quick closing remarks. So Dan asks, there was a story in the New York Times maybe a year ago, maybe yours, about the concept of a massive solar farm in the Sahara. Has anything come of that? No, I don't know. That was not my story and I'm not quite sure. Um, I know there are things like that that pop up from time and time, from time to time um, about solar, you know, the potential of solar power, which you think would just hi, it's a desert, you know, why can't we get this together and deliver electricity to, to much of this continent? Um, I would urge you to check out an old story from an old colleague of mine, Drew Hinshaw at the Wall Street Journal, who wrote a story about living in Accra and putting solar panels on his roof and just the sheer debacle of that. And it was kind of like the stand-in for why why it doesn't work on a grander scale. Um, it's, an, it's a story from like maybe 2014, but it was a good one. And what was the name of the reporter? Drew Hinshaw. Okay. Um, okay, so final two questions that have been submitted here. Have any of the women you've written about chosen to write about their own experiences or write memoirs? These would be very powerful. Yeah, for sure. That's one thing that I really hope happens, especially with the Chibot girls. Um, because they're getting a real, the ones who are sticking with it are getting a real formal education. Um, one of the girls, I think her name, the women, her, her name was called, uh, I think it's Grace is the one I'm thinking of. Um, she seemed like a big, powerful, you know, leader and like she had a lot to say. And I just, I really hope those women, um, all, I hope all, all of them tell their own stories, but those women in particular, I could see them having the most potential to do so just because they're in an academic environment that would encourage and foster that, I hope. Um, and I think it would be incredible. I would love to see them tell their own stories. And I tried to tell them that too when I met with them. And the final question that's been submitted uh, is from Renee, 
who were the suicide bombers targeting and why were women chosen as the bombers and not men? So the suicide bombers were just targeting regular civilians, but um, a lot of times they were targeting soldiers and people who Boko Haram viewed as agents of the government. Um, that was, you know, generally the plan. Um, but a lot of times they considered civilians who weren't part of their group as also agents of the government. And they used women because Boko Haram was a ragtag group of thugs. They didn't have, you know, a military with tanks and, you know, RPGs and that kind of thing to start out with. I mean, they did after they started attacking the military and stealing it. But um, the suicide bombs are really easy to put together and to um, deploy. And so these women would, you know, they, and women were less suspect. They had flowing robes. You couldn't see them. A lot of, you know, soldiers didn't want to pat them down because that was against like a, you know, a cultural taboo. And so they were just became these really, really easy ways for Boko Haram to make a huge impact. And, you know, they're terrorists. What could be more terrorizing than a woman blowing up a bomb? So um, it was a very, very awful and effective tool of war. Dion, this, this has been so incredibly interesting. And um, I think you've, uh, I think when we, when we get a chance to actually look at Alison Wright's photographs that are on view at the museum, um, I think many of which are from Africa and I'm not sure what parts of Africa, but uh, you've just given us so much more context for contemplating the lives and, and challenges and successes that women are having around the world and I'm, I'm so grateful for that. That was um, really fundamentally the, you know, the hope in, um, mm -hmm. in having you give this talk. And, uh, and I want to especially thank you again for doing it in this format, in this uh, crazy world that we're living in right now. Thanks for, thanks so much for being game and uh, taking the time and in your cabin or attic or attic. Where, <laughs> attic. <laughs> um, and I, I want to uh, thank you all for, um, for participating and thank you for your questions and um, let you all know that a recording of this, um, of Dion's presentation and the Q&A afterwards, I think we're going to make it available on, on our website probably sometime next week. That's brattleboromuseum.org. And I believe that Brattleboro Community TV plans to broadcast it as well. And I would like to ask you, please, please, um, this is the first one of these that we've attempted. So if you have suggestions or ideas or thoughts about how we can do this differently or better, obviously we'll figure out the raise hand function and how to make that work. But if you have other suggestions or, or thoughts um, that we should take into account as we probably um, plan to do more events like this, we'd be really grateful for those. So just email us or, or, uh, or maybe contact us through social media, something like that. Um, I'm just seeing this, uh, one more note in the, uh, in the chat function, but that, I, that's not anything I need to, to share. So I guess with that, um, Dion, unless you have any last thoughts, no, thanks so much for having me. I can't wait to come see those photos um, once every Yeah, Yeah, we, we will love to have you yeah. come to Brattleboro. Really look forward to that. Uh, people are saying well done and, and, and thank you in the comments. And thank you again to all of you. Stay safe, stay healthy. Hopefully we'll all get to be together in person before too long. Thanks everyone. <laughs>